Contested Bones, Part 3. We've been looking at the book Contested Bones by John Sanford and Christopher Roop. Um, uh, the website is there and has more information on the bones, uh, on the book itself and also on the authors. And uh, the uh, cover is pictured here and you'll notice that it forms part of the background of our slides. There's the authors Christopher Roop and John Sanford. Um, we've been through uh, prologue in two chapters briefly in the prologue John Sanford believed in evolution until around the age of 50 when he realized the impotence of evolution and the impact of genetic entropy or what you might call devolution and had cognitive dissonance with all the fossil evidence that man evolved from apes. And he and Chris Roop, one of his associates, set out to investigate and their work. Primarily Chris, but also uh, John Sanford, and you'll see his touches in there, uh, created the book. Chapter one discusses the advancing apes icon, you know, the going from apes to man. The evolutionary story itself, scientific method and taxonomic principles laying the groundwork for the rest of the book. Chapter two uh, points out that the textbook picture following Darwin's expectations is a straight line from apes to man. Uh, this was fashionable. There were straight lines in horses. There were straight lines everywhere. It was supposed to be. Uh, the field is now widely acknowledged to be much more bush-like and uh, there are some, I don't know what the percentage, but there's a substantial minority or a majority of the field that will say that the uh, ascent of man cannot be traced. Which sounds like it doesn't really prove anything in terms of evolution. In fact, if anything, it's an argument against ape to human evolution. And the point that he was making, that they were making in this particular chapter is that almost all the fossils are contested and one part of the contestation is compatible with the theory that they're going to present. Then uh, there's a short part that says we'll be looking at humans, apes, and alleged hybrids. And we are now in the first chapter of the human section, the Neanderthals. Chapter three, Homo Neanderthalensis, the first hominin bones. The quote that they have in front is, the irony is that the scientific community is going to have to come around to the acceptance that the Denisovans and the Neanderthals also belong to the species which we all call Homo sapiens. Now, it's an interesting quote for a couple of reasons. One of them is, it, the person who said it finds irony in it. And one of them is, that the scientific community is going to have to come around to the acceptance. Apparently they didn't like it to begin with, and they're stuck with it. But, Moving on, the early history Neanderthal was initially used as a nickname for a non-mineralized skull cap and a few associated bones and bone fragments which were discovered in the, Ander in the Neander Valley of Dusseldorf, Germany in 1856. And uh, they still had those bones in the age of uh, photography. We'll be able to see a photograph of some of them. They probably still have them today. This was the first set of bones to be considered a pre-human hominin. We need a bridge between apes and man, and here we have it. The quote we cite below will use both acceptable spellings, Neanderthal and Neanderthal. They're both actually in German pronounced Neanderthal, meaning Neander Valley in German. The second spelling reflects the most common pronunciation. 
and there's the bones. That's what they found. And you can see there's uh, a fair bit of the skeleton, the backbone, most of the ribs, um, most of the pelvis are missing and the feet are missing. So we don't know what the feet look like on this particular specimen. Since that first discovery, many skeletons have been found displaying similar characteristics. These, those bones are collectively described by the paleo community as Neanderthal. And they are typically given the formal uh, designation Homo neanderthalensis. However, an increasing number of paleo experts refer to, prefer to classify Neanderthal as Homo sapiens. Um, defined as our species and anything that can interbreed with it. Uh, Neanderthals and Homo sapiens are said to have evolved from a common African ancestor about 650,000 years ago. This age estimate is based upon the sequencing of the DNA within the Neanderthal bones and the number of different mutations compared to modern humans. This type of molecular clock dating will be discussed in an upcoming book, so stay tuned, there's more to come. And note that Sanford is a world authority in genetics. Um, <clears throat> molecular clock methods require questionable assumptions about mutation rates. And when you straighten out those assumptions, you get interesting answers, but that's my own comment. Um, the first European Neanderthal fossils are thought to be 400,000 years old based on uranium series dating. And uh, they're foreshadowing that they're going to talk about dating methods in chapter 12, so we'll, we'll get into that pretty heavily. Nearly 500 Neanderthal skeletons have been discovered at 124 sites located in Europe, the Near East and Western Asia. The primary distinctive feature of Neanderthal skeletons involves the shape of the skull, which is typically elongated front to back. The result is a pushed back forehead, which exposes strong brow ridges, a pushed forward lower face, a reduced chin, and a slightly enlarged occipital bun, a slight bulge at the rear of the skull. The brain case of the Neanderthal was large, typically larger than most humans. They had more brains than we did. Uh, Neanderthals are not significantly different from the modern man from the neck down. They are described as being stout with robust, rugged skeletons, indicating powerful musculature. They had relatively short arms and legs and had deep funnel-shaped chests. Now, funnel-shaped is something that is not as typical of humans um, and is more typical of apes just for what it's worth, and we're gonna see some skeletons in a little bit, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, uh, they stood fully upright and walked and moved like modern humans. Neanderthals lived alongside an an anatomically modern humans. The contact zone between them is described as extensive and long-lasting, providing ample opportunity for interbreeding. Recent genetic analysis have confirmed what many paleo experts have long suspected. Neanderthals and Homo sapiens were interfertile and interbred. Neanderthal genes are present in modern populations. The DNA of Europeans and Asians contain approximately one to four percent Neanderthal DNA. Now, I will warn you, that's not actually true. It's just we have more uh, DNA that's more like Neanderthals than it is like certain African tribes. And uh, that could easily have come from Neanderthals. And, and, and uh, so I would, uh, you know, I think it's fair to say that we do to interbreed with them. Um, we're going to come to another number in just a little bit that is much more accurate as to how much human Neanderthals are. Recently, paleo experts have classified a new form of Homo, which lived alongside both Neanderthals and modern humans. In 2008, bone fragments were found together with Neanderthal bones in the uh, Denisova cave. Uh, you can find two different pronunciations in the, uh, uh, on the internet. One of them is uh, Denisova, and the other one is Denisova. 
I talked to the uh, uh, some people who know Russian who happen to be related to me, and they say that Denisova is the proper pronunciation, just for what it's worth. In southern Siberia, the remains were very meager, just the tip of a finger bone and a few teeth. That's what we have. But they can get DNA out of them, and so uh, we can say that they're not exactly like the average human. They're not exactly like the Neanderthal. They're something slightly different, but close enough. What really distinguished the Denisovan bones was the DNA extracted from them, which displayed some distinctive mutations. These Denisovans have not yet been given official species designation. That's why they're just called Denisovans instead of Homo Denisoveni or something. Um, David Reich of Harvard has said, Denisovans are a genome in search of a fossil. And there's some truth to that. Recent DNA analysis suggests Denisovans also were found, along with Neanderthals and modern humans, in a cave in Spain. In our opinions, Denisovans were simply a genetic variant of Neanderthal. Just as Neanderthal DNA has been found within Europeans and Asians, traces of Denisovan DNA appears to be present in people groups living in Southeast Asia. That is the uh, New Guinea Papuans, Australian Aborigines, and the Mamanwa people of the Philippines. And if you want to Google something fun, Google the Manama, Manamwa uh, people, and you'll find out that they look a lot like Australian Aborigines. Uh, however, when considering ancient DNA evidence, Caution is required because ancient DNA is usually highly degraded and thus is difficult to reconstruct with fidelity. And there's always the problem of getting human DNA uh, con contaminating the specimen too. So, um, Over the years it, it became increasingly evident to the paleo community that Neanderthals and Denisovans were fully human and were very much like us. The Neanderthals are said to have gone extinct roughly 30,000 years ago. However, the latest DNA evidence indicates that the Neanderthal populations never truly went extinct. They simply merged into the European population or the Asian population as the case may be. <coughs> Again, this argues that Neanderthal was Homo sapiens. The dehumanization of Neanderthals. Remember, you're in an era when the theory predicts there should be a half ape, half man, and, and various gradations, and so they're desperately looking for these. Uh, they start out by saying to dehumanize, and I'm skipping stuff, so you know, if you want to read the full context, the book is there. A Neanderthal man, William King, put professor of geology at Queen's College in Galway, Ireland, was the first scientist to impose a subhuman interpretation onto the fossils. When examining the skull cap found in Neander Valley Cave, King commented, I feel myself constrained to believe that the thoughts and desires which once dwelt within it never soared beyond those of a brute. Constrained by what? Maybe the theory without any realization of how you have to be careful about whether theories are true or not, but anyway. King focused on the heavy brow ridges and noted its resemblance to those of chimps and gorillas. At a meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science in 1863, King assigned the fossils to a subhuman species of man, Homo neanderthalensis. In his view, the Neanderthals were too brutish to be considered human. In 1866, Ernst Haeckel proposed the name Homo stupidus, <laughs> which doesn't require a lot of translation there, does it? Uh, in 1886, two nearly complete skeletons were found in association with stone tools and artifacts at a Belgian site in Spy. Max Lohest and Julian Freipont uh, probably butchering those French names, um, from the University of Liege, misleadingly 
reconstructed the skeletons with an ape-like bent kneed posture. Modern paleo expert Ian Tattersall writes, from the anatomy of the leg bones, Frepont and Lohes came to the conclusion that these individuals had walked upright, but with bent knees. Just as, in fact, apes do when they stand up. Thus started the myth of the bent kneed Neanderthals, a myth that was to endure more than half a century. In 1908, the old man was discovered in a cave at La Chapelle, Alsace, France. Marceline Boulet of the National Museum of Natural History in Paris was called in to examine the fossils. Boulet is responsible for what the paleoanthropology community now regards as the most inaccurate reconstruction of a hominin skeleton, second only to the Piltdown Man fraud. The old man was made to appear very apish with a grasping big toe and bent knee, bent hip posture. Boulet's characterization inspired the first artistic depiction of a Neanderthal, as shown in figure three, which I'm skipping over a few paragraphs, but there's the figure three. You can see, he's got his knees bent. Uh, interestingly, the arm towards us is long enough to reach to his knee, which is unusual for humans, um, but General Sheridan had it. Uh, famously, um, and uh, uh, the arm behind is more human-like. So this is a, literally a half man, half ape, although I'm not sure that's quite what the artist wanted to draw. Uh, the Smithsonian Natural History Museum website tells of Boulay's uh, fraudulent reconstruction, stating, the original reconstruction of the old man of La Chapelle by scientist Pierre Marceline Boulet led to the reason why popular cultures stereotype Neanderthals as dim-witted brutes for so many years. In 1911, Boulet reconstructed the skeleton with a severely curved spine indicative of a stooped, slouching stance with bent knees, forward flexed hips, and the head jutted forward. However, additional discoveries of Neanderthal skeletons coupled with a re-examination of the old man's skeleton in the 1950s, showed that many of the features thought to be unique in Neanderthals fall within the range of modern human variation, and that the old man suffered from gross deforming arth osteoarthritis. But this isn't the whole, quite the whole story. Now, no, this is coming from the website of, what was it, the uh, Smithsonian Natural History Museum. This is official, the whole story. It appears that Boulay's own preconceptions about early humans and his rejection of the hypothesis that Neanderthals were the ancestors of modern humans led him to reconstruct a stooped brutish creature, effectively placing Neanderthals on a side branch of the human evolutionary tree. Boulet even gave his reconstruction an opposable big toe like great apes. But there was no bone deformity that should or could have led to this interpretation. I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't believed it. <laughs> Boulet, his ape-like caricature of Neanderthal man, is still deeply embedded in modern culture. As Tattersall acknowledges, the skeleton of the old man from La Chapelle was misinterpreted by Marceline Boulet in 1908-11 to yield a classic caricature of Neanderthals as shuffling bent kneed brutes. It is only very recently that museum displays and artistic renditions of Neanderthals have begun to change. Figure four, which we'll see. The general public and scientists outside the paleo community are still largely unaware of what the real Neanderthal man looked like. They get all their stuff old and outdated. The old, the new. There's some similarities, but you notice that the new one could easily pass for human. In the 1900s, debates continued regarding the status of Neanderthals. 
On one side were those who advocated an evolutionary interpretation of Neanderthals, either as descendants of apes excluded from the branch leading to man, as Boulle believed, or a missing link between Pithecanthropus, otherwise known as Java man, which has mostly disappeared, by the way, and modern humans. On the other side were those who took issue with Boulle's reconstruction and insisted Neanderthals were fully human. Now, uh, there's a note, let's see, uh, and a, a notice that uh, Boulle is going to explain why he was sure that Neanderthal man was not actually one of our ancestors, but was more like a relative. Um, Boule believed Neanderthals had evolved from apes and were not directly related to modern humans, rather a missing link between ape and man as others had claimed. He wrote, we are aware of no descendants, obviously including ourselves. Instead, he accepted Piltdown Man. Well, actually, this is one of the errors in the book. Uh, Piltdown Man, <laughs> maybe that's a better name for it. <laughs> as the likely ancestor of man. Others such as um, uh, K. Uh, Georgianovic uh, Kramberger and Gustav Schwalbe disagreed and maintained that Neanderthal was the immediate ancestor to man. So you could have it either way. Uh, but notice that Piltdown Man was the ancestor. And uh, uh, my dad lived his, a good share of his adult life having to explain how Piltdown Man fit into Genesis. And of course, nobody has to do that anymore. Sort of reminds you of the Yellowstone Fossil Forest, doesn't it? Um, William Strauss and A.J.E. A. E. Cave, anatomist who provided a much more accurate construction of the old man from La Chapelle, uh, they wrote in the Quarterly Review of Biology, if he could be reincarnated and placed in a New York subway, provided that he were bathed, shaved, and dressed in modern clothing, it is doubtful whether he would attract any more attention than some of its other denizens. Was, he looks like. <laughs> um, this view eventually carried the day within the paleo community. Eric Trinkhaus, a form foremost authority on Neanderthals, has concluded, Detailed comparisons of Neanderthal skeletal remains with those of modern humans have shown that there is nothing in Neanderthal anatomy that conclusively indicates locomotor, manipulative, intellectual, or linguistic abilities inferior to those of modern humans. They're human. While the paleo community has abandoned the apish de depictions of Neanderthals, People outside the field still envision Neanderthal as being less d evolved than our modern humans. As Jared Diamond, how many of you have heard of Jared Diamond? Yeah, a few of you. Uh, wrote, what was it, Guns, Germs, and Steel. Big explanation of how uh, Eurasia, and Europe in particular, came to dominate uh, the world picture, and it has to do with geography. And there's two subtexts, one of which is in the, uh, uh, one of which is, is common, and that is that it really didn't have to uh, do with them being brighter than the rest of the world. And I would agree with that. The other subtext is, and it didn't have to, anything to do with their religion. This is the answer to science developed within Christianity. What is the basis of this assertion? Apart from his evolutionary preconception, Diamond's assertion was made in ignorance of what is actually widely accepted within the paleo community. They're behind the times. They're 50 to 100 years behind the times. They're certainly behind the knowledge that we have today. The paleo experts who classified Neanderthal as Homo sapiens freely acknowledged the fact that they displayed unique features not typically seen in modern humans. It is uncontested in the paleo community that Neanderthals share a cluster of traits that are unusual. What is contested is whether or not those distinctive traits are sufficient. Uh, missed a, 
uh, a mutation that I didn't correct. Um, <laughs> sufficient grounds to justify classifying Neanderthal as a separate subhuman species. The biological species concept is the most widely accepted definition of a species and was developed by Ernst Meyer. The BSC states that if members of the same or different populations are able to interbreed and produce fertile progeny, then they're considered the same species, which, you know, kind of makes sense. That was the original definition of species. Um, <clears throat> however, since Neanderthals are no longer living, the BSC did not seem directly applicable. That changed when scientists were able to recover Neanderthal DNA. But in the meantime, what do you do? Well, apart from BSC, the next best way to determine whether Neanderthals are a separate human species is to use the morphological species concept. As the name suggests, the MSC emphasizes morphologically distinctive traits as the basis for defining, and there's another mutation, a new species. Using the MSC, it was traditionally believed that the anatomical features characteristic of Neanderthals were indicators of their complete reproductive isolation from Homo sapiens, and therefore separateness as a species. The MSC model, that is the assumption that superficial morphological differences indicate reproductive isolation and hence justify separate species status, has been thoroughly falsified by the recent sequencing of Neanderthal DNA. This DNA evidence provides compelling evidence for gene flow, interfertility, between modern Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. Neanderthals are, and anatomically modern humans are by definition all Homo sapiens. This vindicates the paleoanthropologists who are lumpers. Well, I, I would have to agree with them. Neanderthal features seen in modern humans. Human individuals living today display classic Neanderthal features, or some of them anyway. If the same traits can be found in modern humans as well as in early modern Homo sapiens populations, then there is no rational basis for continuing to treat Neanderthal as a separate species. There's skeletons. Now, if you look here, you'll notice that the rib cage goes pretty much up until about the third, second ribs and then starts to curve in. You'll notice that this kind of tapers all the way through. That's funnel-shaped chest versus a barrel-shaped chest. So there's one difference. Um, is it enough to make a brand new species? Well, they're gonna argue no. The former world champion boxer, Nikolai Valuev, also a member of the Russian parliament, well, you don't have to be too intelligent to do that, um, <laughs> happens to display Neanderthal-like features in the skull. He has a sloping forehead and heavy brow ridges, characteristics of Neanderthal. His chin is modern, but if his skull cap were found as an isolated bone in the fossil record, as most Neanderthal skull caps are found, a splitter might misclassify him as a separate species. Like a large part of the human race, Mr. Valuev probably carries Neanderthal DNA. You want to see him? Brow ridges, sloping forehead, What's, what's the one part of him that doesn't look Neanderthal? Chin. Chin, exactly. But, you know, obviously subhuman. What can I say? But he's a good boxer. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Thomas Huxley was the first to compare Australian Aboriginal skulls to Neanderthals in 1863. He noted the skulls displayed a number of morphologic similarities to, to Neanderthals. Ooh, racism, anybody? Decades later, in Journal of Anatomy, anatomists dubbed an aboriginal skull Neanderthaloid, which showed so-called primitive features characteristic of Neanderthals, such as an extremely low sloping forehead and a pronounced brow ridge. Three fairly complete skulls were excavated from a cave in Eshkol. I'm wondering whether they just anglicize, or uh, uh, I guess you'd say uh, uh, Hebraized, Hebraized or something, uh, a word because skull looks, looks a lot like <laughs> the English skull on the slope of Mount Carmel region from northern Israel in the 1930s. 
Some skulls displayed elongated and low-lying vaults, forward projecting faces, pronounced brow ridges, and a reduced chin. Because of their archaic looking features, these skulls were cited by other researchers as evidence of interbreeding between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. Now remember, this is before we had DNA evidence. The researchers, who, the researchers who excavated the remains made the following observation. We are of the opinion that the variability found amongst the fossil people of Mount Carmel is greater in degree and in kind than is to be observed in any local community in modern times. Had the Mount Carmel people been discovered, not collectively in one place, but separately in diverse localities, each excavator would have been convinced that a new and separate form of humanity had been unearthed. So great does one Carmelite individual differ from another. And there's uh, skull five it was one of the skulls found in S skull. And uh, we're going to read about Kafitz the, or very briefly. Uh, there's more in the book about him. Um, I'm going to skip over a lot of stuff at this point. Um, Jabil Kafitz is mentioned, and there's a bunch of stuff in there. And then there's the melodic remains recovered from a cave in the Czech Republic in the late 1800s and early 1900s. So these things are old. They've been around for a while. Huxley correctly suspected at the time of Darwin that the morphologic boundary used to distinguish Homo sapiens and Neanderthal skulls was arbitrary. That's Thomas H. Huxley, Darwin's bulldog. Uh, now, before you think, oh, they're creationists, no. You see, from their point of view, species is a gradually developing concept and uh, there is no uh, clear-cut break. So um, the fact that somebody says this does not mean they're a creationist. It just means that uh, they think that they're close enough that it's really hard to tell the difference. Even today, paleo-expert debate about whether certain skulls should be classified as Homo sapiens or Neanderthals, uh, even today, paleo experts debate about whether certain skulls should be classified as Homo sapiens or Neanderthals because they are not readily distinguishable. And again, I'm not reading the whole thing. Um, skipping over the extensive coexistence with Homo sapiens in the fossil record, which uh, the title tells you all you need to know. The Pit of Bones, Neanderthals, Erectus, and Homo sapiens. In 1992, a team led by Juan Luis Arsuaga of the Complutense University in Madrid discovered a pit of bones, or as they would say, Cima de los Huesos, hidden within a complex of caves in the Sierra de Atapuerca of nor northern Spain. In the journal Nature, paleo experts Chris Stringer list, listed numerous features that are characteristic of the three major Homo species, including Erectus, Neanderthals, and Homo sapiens. By the way, we'll be doing the Erectus next, year, uh, next week, um, barring some interruption there. The extent of variation seen in the Cima de los Huesos sample encompasses all the so-called archaic humans. Archaic humans include those who cannot be neatly categorized as either Erectus or Neanderthals because they share qualities of both. For example, Homo heidelbergensis. Stringer writes, in spite of all the variation they display, they get sucked in with the Neanderthals. Once that happens, it becomes very difficult to prevent the rest of the European material from getting sucked in as well. This is consistent with lo what lumpers have always maintained, that Erectus, Heidelbergensis, Neanderthals, and Homo sapiens all belong to the same interbreeding species. In 2016, Meyer et al. reported in Nature an analysis of a small segment of nuclear and mitochondrial DNA extracted from five bone samples from within the pit, presumably different individuals. The nuclear DNA suggested they were Neanderthal, yet the mitochondrial DNA indicated a Denisovan ancestor. This supports the interpretation that they had different genetic histories yet could all interbreed and are all one species, in which case you might as well call them homo sapiens. 
DNA analysis confirms Neanderthals interbred with Homo sapiens. The discovery of the first Neanderthal man in 1856 sparked a century and a half long debate surrounding the question of whether Neanderthals were fully human or a separate subhuman species. Or superhuman species, maybe? They have bigger brains. Anyway, much of the debate has centered on the question of whether they are not they interbred with early modern humans. Uh, they list corroborating evidence of this, which is not DNA evidence, but in some of it, which was mitochondrial DNA in particular. However, the results of mitochondrial DNA analyses were argued to be inconclusive evidence of interbreeding. And I see I didn't put a note up. Um, most paleo experts dug in their heels and argued against the possibility of gene exchange and assumed complete reproductive isolation between Neanderthals and modern humans. However, a milestone study published in the prestigious journal Science in 2010 and a number of subsequent DNA analysis seems to have settled the debate once and for all. Remember that quote that the paleo community has to, is being drug into, is being forced into assuming that Neanderthals are in fact human. Geneticist uh, Svante Pabo writes, many would say that a species is a group of organisms that can produce fertile offspring with each other and cannot do so with members of other groups. From that perspective, we, have, we had shown that Neanderthals and modern humans were the same species. The Neanderthal DNA was extracted from a well-preserved Neanderthal specimen from uh, Vindija Cave in Croatia. I should probably ask an expert whether that cave stays cool all year. Because if it doesn't, it suggests that we can do a lot more DNA analysis than what was previously assumed. Maybe back two millions of years ago. Uh, or at least millions of assumed years ago. Um, <clears throat> the sequence is then aligned with the DNA from five modern humans from various geographic locations, as well as with the chimp genome. The researchers concluded Neanderthals fall within the variation of present day humans for many regions of the genome. The National Human Genetic Research Institute says, Neanderthal DNA is 99.7% identical to present day human DNA. What so if, happened to the chimp? What? What happened to the chimp DNA? Well, the chimp DNA, you know, that's a big debate. If you select the right areas, you can get 98, 99%. If you take the entire genome, it depends on who's doing the counting but it's a maximum of about 90%. And the reason that is, is because humans have, in fact, only 90% of the DNA of chimps. So that it can't be any more than that, mathematically. And if you're being fair to the data, it's probably somewhere between 85 and 70, depending on what criteria you're using for matching. In the, in the human Y chromosome, it's a maximum of 70%. There's 30% DNA that doesn't match anything in humans in chimpanzee Y. And there is 30% uh, of human Y DNA that doesn't match chimpanzees. We've been over that before. Um, but so th these people are 99.7 is probably with close to within the range for humans today. Small segments of Denisovan genomes have also been sequenced, revealing that they interbred with Neanderthal and Homo sapiens. Present day Europeans and Asians are as far south, uh, pardon me, Asians as far south and east as Polynesia contain traces of Denisovan DNA. Svanti Pavo, uh, observed that Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, and Denisovans are part of a large interconnected network of people, which he calls a metapopulation, who exchange genes with one another. They're all one big happy, well, maybe not happy, but family. 
Um, archaeology confirms Neanderthals had modern human intelligence. For a long time, the paleoanthropology community has incorrectly assumed Neanderthal was an intellectually inferior species with a limited cultural inventory. However, more recent archaeological evidence recovered over the past few decades has prompted many paleo experts to reevaluate the cognitive competency of the Neanderthal people. It turns out that the presumed intellectual inferiority was derived from evolutionary preconceptions rather than actual evidence. Which means evolutionary preconceptions are not a really good guide to reality. Think about it. Skipping on, uh, I mean, there's some really interesting stuff here that I'm just having to skim over because otherwise we'll never finish in time. Paleolithic archaeologist Paleo, Paolo Villa, cur curator at the University of Colorado Museum of Natural History, argues that the comparison of technology between the Upper Paleolithic and the Middle Paleolithic cultures is like comparing the performance of Model T Fords, widely used in America and Europe in the early part of the last century, to the performance of a modern day Ferrari, and concluding that Henry Ford was cognitively inferior to Enzo Ferrari. Does not follow. Skipping on some more, I mean, this, uh, it's really rich material. Uh, one of the most impressive technologies employed by Neanderthals, dating as far back as 200,000 years ago, is their ability to synthesize pitch from bir birch bark through the controlled use of fire. Neanderthals used birch bark pitch as a type of adhesive to haft tools and weapons, that is, fixing flint flakes on a wooden handle. So you want a spear, well you want the spearhead to be bound to the body. Well one of the things you can do is you can you know, tie it on, well that's not very secure. Another thing you can do is carve or split the wood of the, of the spear handle and then use a glue. So they go for the glue, but they're using birch bark pitch, okay? Unlike natural forms of glue, which can be taken directly from a tree, such as sap, but aren't very good, birch bark pitch must be carefully produced through a complex process involving distillation in the absence of oxygen, otherwise it'll burn, and the careful regulation of temperature between 340 to 400 degrees centigrade. And if you want to do a quick calculation, you can figure that's really hot Fahrenheit. Experimental archaeologists have attempted to produce birch bark pitch without the use of modern technology. For instance, after many trials, German archaeologist Friedrich Palmer was able to produce small amounts of pitch through this process. After many attempts. Knowing that it could be done. Just, uh, don't forget, the people who did it first weren't told it could be done. They had to figure that out on their own. And if they had to tried it, you know, 15 times and failed, maybe they would have quit. Uh, Will Robux, an accompanying archaeologist, commented on the feat in wonder. He remarked that the know-how required of Neanderthals to perform this tax task goes to show that they were very capable pyrotechnologists. We're still, in, we're still learning how they did it a quarter of a million years ago. Another team had great difficulty as well, but with a thermometer, where do you get that? <laughs> they were able to do it on the first try. Paleoarchaeologists are hard pressed to know how exactly Neanderthals were able to perform a sophisticated process recognized today by chemistry as dry distillation. Via et al. note, experimental studies show that the production of pitch in the absence of airtight pottery containers requires a high degree of technical knowledge. And how do you know they did it in the absence? Well, because you can't find any pottery around. S uh, skipping on, but uh, here's some photos of their uh, music. Well, those are really hyena teeth. Don't worry about it. Nothing to see here. This is a guy buried in ceremonial attire. You do that when you expect an afterlife. 
Well, atheists do that now because it's culturally expected, but whatever. And then here's a horse carved out of stone. Hmm. Pretty decently passable. Looks like uh, missing a few legs by now. Conclusion, Neanderthal was fully human. Since the uh, time of Darwin, Neanderthals have been proclaimed to the world as a separate subhuman species, unworthy of the classification Homo sapiens. However, there is now compelling evidence from numerous sources that Neanderthals were fully human and should be classified as Homo sapiens. Neanderthal anatomy is overwhelmingly modern as the paleo community now universally concedes. The most notable differences are confined to the skull. However, those same features are found in certain skulls belonging to Homo sapiens from various sites throughout Europe, including I Israel, Spain, and the Czech Republic. Thomas Huxley and many others Contemporary paleo experts have further noted that Neanderthals and Homo sapiens can be arranged into a morphological continuum, which argues against their separateness as a species. Not surprisingly, lumpers have insisted that Neanderthals should be reclassified as Homo sapiens. Famous sites such as the Pit of Bones in Spain show that it is possible for a single population to display features characteristic of all major hominin species in the genus Homo, Erectus, Heidelbergensis, Neanderthals, and Homo sapiens. In 2010, the sequencing of the Neanderthal genome confirmed that Neanderthals and Denisovans are members of our own species, Homo sapiens. Neanderthal burial sites cor corroborate what the DNA evidence is now showing. Homo sapiens and Neanderthals lived, lived together in the same communities, intermarried, worked together, and were buried together. Why are we separating them and not just thinking of them as variants? Like, you know, like a pygmy or, or a short statured person. That's a historical question. Historically, Neanderthals were discovered just when we needed an ape to man transition. It was the first one. And so it got placed. People looked at it, making it look like it was an ape man. And the paleological community uh, uh, has had to come around to the idea that they're really human. Finally, archaeological evidence recovered over the last few decades has refuted the myth that the Neanderthals were intellectually inferior to modern humans. In conclusion, the evidence from paleontology, archaeology, and modern genetics all dramatically confirm that the Neanderthal people were in every respect fully humans. Neanderthal is us. That famous painting of the ape to man transition, the next to the last person doesn't belong there. It's really human. Now my take, the, I think the chapter makes a convincing argument that Neanderthals along with Denise Vincent and Heidelberg man were human variants. I've omitted Erectus because that's next week. They do not seem to be particularly dumb. One can use them as primitive humans with some ape-like features, I suppose, but they're very close to modern humans. Um, and there's probably not any good reason to dispute that they came from modern humans or humans came from them or something like that. Remember the Bush theory of human evolution? Okay, we talked about that last week. The Bush theory of human evolution is okay, but we do need to have a main stem if you're going to have uh, a, uh, an ape to man transition and therefore common ancestry. Common descent requires that some population had continuous ancestor descendant relationships all the way from apes to humans. Now the classic one is to have a straight line. That's the classic picture, okay? Uh, you have to keep something going, or maybe it's slightly different, coming out of the page or into the page. Uh, uh, this is Hilbert space multidimensional, not straight, uh, not just two-dimensional. I'm just drawing it in two-dimensional with time. Um, but um, uh, what, what uh, really probably happened, if you're going to be more modern about it, is to say that there were several populations that intermixed and uh, wove in among themselves. I've drawn two, but you can imagine more. Um, and then you have the ape, and then you have 
australopithecines and various stages along the way that lived for a while and kept going and then stopped. Um, remember there's the uh, uh, Stephen Jay Gould theory which says that the intermediates didn't exist for more than a few hundred years, a few thousand years maybe, and if they didn't get uh, preserved then it looks like a jump, which is a good way of explaining why there are jumps. What you cannot have be it ever so bushy, is to have two different trees with two different trunks. That's what you can't have. Now where does Neanderthal fit into it? Well, it's in the top right one, oh, oh, before we get there, remember that if you have that, somewhere along the line you have to have a slanted line over here. If you don't have that, if that's gone, then this is not common descent period. Okay. And Neanderthals fit in maybe up here. But they're 99.7 and the chimps are like 90, uh, maybe 85. Um, so they're way close to this end, if that's the case. Maybe they actually belong here. <coughs> With the data we have, we can't say for sure with just the Neanderthals. But now we're going to look at the uh, Homo erectus and then we're going to look at uh, the Australopithecines and then we're going to look at Homo habilis and uh, Homo naledi and Homo sediba and by the time we get done we're going to have some kind of a picture. And at that point you can look at it and say does it fit more of a, this kind of thing or does it fit more of this kind of thing? And I think that you'll have some argument as to whether apes really did produce humans. Um, but that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Everybody quiet. Go ahead. I learned somewhere that caves keep a pretty constant temperature around 56 degrees Fahrenheit. It, it depends on the cave. Um, and uh, that is correct that caves do tend to have a fairly constant temperature. Um, in the summer they're cool, in the winter they're, they tend to be a little warmer. It depends on the cave. If you have a cave that goes up, then it will trap uh, warm air a little bit. If you've got a cave that goes down, uh, the cool air can actually sink into it. And, then, and if it's deep enough, the, the warmth of summer never reaches it. And you can actually have what they call ice caves. And those ones are constant temperature and they're like 32 degrees. Or sometimes even below. Yes, comment over here. Now, in the article, it mentioned something about some nuclear dating on those. Is there uh, some concern that there might be a problem with that nuclear dating? Nuclear dating? You mean like, uh, well, to start out with, the authors of the book are not going to tackle the age question at all. They're just leaving that and they're just leaving the assumptions and that's why you saw millions of years without them challenging it. They will get to that in chapter 12 and they will actually ask the question is whether you really trust this stuff or not. And how much do you trust it and why do you trust it and so forth. And maybe we shouldn't be trusting it. Yes, the, the, we'll give you the talking stick. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I found so, feel so powerful. Um, from, a, from a biblical standpoint, how could Neanderthal be explained? I mean, it, it's human, 
but it is different. I think more different than than humans are today. Um, so, I any thoughts about that? Actually, they'll get to trying to make a summary of all of this stuff in chapter 14. They're going to have their own theory. It's not going to be completely detailed, uh, but th I think I, I can probably fairly give you the uh, the the final answer that they give, and that is that apes are one cluster, humans are another cluster, entirely separate, and that um, the ape to human, uh, that march of the apes is based on very flimsy evidence and sometimes misread in favor of theory and largely based on theory. So, I mean, but I mean, it seems though Neanderthals would, or post flood, would need to come from Shim, Ham, Japheth, and the wives. Yes. And so it seems as though maybe some sort of um, bottleneck where you have somebody heading off somewhere, starting with their genes, perhaps there's more variation amongst them originally and maybe a small group that when the population start uh, spreading back together and merging and they just interbreed and, and then they're and then they're they absorbed. disappear I, I think that would be a, a reasonable subplot of the uh, of the uh, of the overall general plot which you know obviously has to include all of the uh, findings I think Neanderthals are the easiest ones to integrate because the community has pretty much accepted them for what they are. Basically variant humans. With all of the intelligence, with all of the other stuff. Last week you lumpers suggested to me that there are lots of these giant skeletons around and so I went home and read about it. Now I want to have some DNA done on giant skeletons. Um, yes, yes. Uh, it, it would be very interesting to see uh, some of that done. Uh, I kind of think that they're somewhere, but I know that they have not been put out front and center um, because you don't see them in museums today. Um, but there are all kinds of uh, newspaper articles. I mean, it's not just one or two. There's they dug them up over here, they dug them up over here, they dug them up over here. Um, presumably, unless people are, are into completely destroying specimens, some of them are still around. Um, it would be interesting to see what kind of DNA they had. Yes, and then we have a comment back here. Oh. <coughs> Uh, All right, let me okay. just quick, I don't have much to sure. say, but uh, the point is this, that uh, especially if you looked at that um, modernized or updated uh, version of the Netherdale girl, she's clearly East European. Yeah. And if you, if you travel enough, and I was traveling a lot when I was a kid, and wasn't paying attention, but for instance on the African continent, the heights, you get the Dinka and the Nuer and the Anuaks in uh, southern Sudan, then you get the little pygmies down in the jungles of the, I mean, the range is so huge. And the head shape, I mean, this very famous um, Russian boxer, for instance, I mean, I instantly recognized him because, you know, when you were a little kid, you followed sport and stuff. I mean, his deformities, they're not deformities. You find them all over the place. So the range within the human species is far greater than most of us have ever bothered to study. You can buy certain books where they go and cover all the funny shapes of human beings, and you don't know whether all some of them might be deformed by disease as children or so on, but the range is phenomenal. So Netherlands are closer to humans than humans are to each other. Yeah, well, as a matter of fact, I went to school with a guy whose chin receded like that, and now I have a, a short-tailed relative whose chin recedes. He wears a beard all the time, hides it. <laughs> but what? Some of the kings of England had chins that went. 
Yeah, so I don't know, you know, I, I think that it's, there was a prejudice that needed to have what they thought they had and then made them subhuman because this, this would be one more link along the chain. What people forget is the missing link, you don't have a missing link, you have actually a missing chain. There's not a lot of links. And one of the things that the book is going to go through is to go one cha link, one link, one link, and one link, and just go through all of the, all of the well-accepted links in the chain. Well, you're going to find out that they're not really all that well-accepted, and you're going to find out that there's a lot of controversy about them. And you're going to find out that some of the controversy actually fits pretty neatly into the theory that they'll propose at the end. Uh, comment here, and then we'll go for it. We assume that the dinosaurs were all pre-flood. Are we sure that none of the humans we dig up were not pre-flood? Uh, some of them are in strata that if they were, if they were uh, pre-flood, then uh, the flood has to last a long, long time. Uh, and some of them are in strata that I, it's really hard to see how they wouldn't be post-flood. Well, some of the dinosaurs are very close to the surface. Well, uh, yeah, it depends on where you're looking at it. And there, there is some question as to whether dinosaurs actually were all destroyed in the flood. That maybe a few of them got through, um, and that uh, then for various and sundry reasons they died out. And there's still some interesting rumors in the Congo that, uh, that have, people have tried to check out and unfortunately, they don't have documentary evidence of, but there's, uh, it's not unreasonable to, to say there could be still some dinosaurs roaming around, not everywhere, but in some nice jungle areas where you'd kind of expect them to be. Comment? We're just curious about um, if Neanderthal, uh, like uh, 99 point, Seven, Six, eight, seven percent yeah. human. Then it would be safe to assume that uh, there will be a prolific ninety-nine point seven percent of procreation. Why were the discoveries so scarce and not communities of them found? Maybe they're not really human. Ninety-nine point seven. It'd be interesting to see what the variation within humans themselves is. And and uh, what the percentage of DNA? I don't have that on on my fingertips, but uh, you know, if 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 the variation between uh, let's say an Australian Aborigine and uh, um, and an African uh, from interior of Africa and somebody from Norway, if that's ninety nine point six, you know. I'm not sure that we really want to make the case that uh, Neanderthals weren't human. I mean, th that's just not enough variation to make the difference. Were there enough discoveries of, of, of communities of them to show, because man is really good at defending its turf. It, it, it has a high quality of manhood in them. They, they probably would have been a lot more than what we've been seeing or have been discovering. Well, if, if you find out that uh, marrying outside of the clan does better for your offspring, uh, then you can see people, you know, mixing other DNA in and, and after a while it all kind of just merges and it'd be really hard to pick out. And that's what the that's what the most recent theory is as to what happened to the Neanderthals. They didn't actually die out, they just, their distinctive features uh, got merged with everything else and kind of uh, disappeared in the, in, the, in the, to pardon the expression, the Cro-Magnon wave. Um, just this week on radio they had a mention of the fact that the last century was the most bloody in human history and I don't know if it's true or not, but I have been shocked and surprised to find that I have ancestors going to before Christ was born in Ireland to Germany in the 1400s, and I'm saying, I thought we were a primitive people.
people back then. No, we are primitive people today. Well, after World War II and Stalin and Mao and uh, Pol Pot and uh, yeah, it's <laughs> Idi Amin, yeah, uh, Mugabe. I mean, you know, I guess maybe uh, we're not as primitive, or we're not as advanced as we think we are. But yes. Uh, just a, a more general comment. We have here a, probably a fairly good example of where a theory uh, dominated uh, the interpretation and, uh, in fact, uh, helped manufacture a little bit of data. Yeah, uh, the, 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 the uh, thumbs on the feet were made out of whole cloth. Uh, and uh, this, humans do this. I think the lesson for us is that this is a two-edged sword. Yeah. And thorough, careful work is the only solution to this. Uh, and we need to be careful. Uh, we've talked about these large bones, you know, that uh, we haven't found and so on, that supposedly are somewhere and so on. Uh, and I'm sure there's some of them there somewhere. But uh, we also need to be careful that uh, some people love to make up stories, and uh, well, this is the way you get your articles published, is to make them dramatic. And uh, we, yeah. we need to not fall into that trap. Well, that's why it would be really interesting to, to see if we could actually find something to, to uh, correspond with all the newspaper articles that were out there. Um, <coughs> and, and then once we did, it looks like you can do DNA on people who are long dead. You know, the, the Canaanites and the uh, people of Lebanon come to mind. Five Canaanites, uh, apparently the temporal bone is pretty hard and, and saves DNA for a long time, and you can, you can do those things. 23 and my great-great-great-grandfather. <coughs> so does he go over uh, Lucy? Uh, what? In the book, do they go over the, Lucy? It will go over Lucy. That was kind of a fragment, too, right? Yeah, well, uh, they're going to po point out some very interesting things. One of them is that the Australopithecines that we have found do have thumbs on the feet. They have those you know, short, sideways, pointing big toes, which is not human. And interestingly, the, the footprints in Crete have the normal big toes with the big toe about the same length as the other toes and n right next to it and, you know, the footprint, I mean, the, the toe prints are pretty, pretty clear. And so there's all kinds of stuff coming out now. Um, in fact, it's been, some of it's been there for a while. Uh, where Lucy was there, they actually found basically in the footprints that are indistinguishable from human footprints, the Laetoli footprints. I think we went over that once a long time ago. Go ahead. Well, this raises a question, and why, why do you think it's coming out now? Is there some meta element that's causing this to come out? Is the ones that were promoting this feeling that there was too many, I don't know, but do you have some thoughts on that? Or? Um, well, I think there are two reasons for that. Okay, one of them is there is a conflict between putting out what you know in the middle of a fight versus putting out what you know as a, attempting to be the most objective scholar you can be. If you're putting things out in the middle of a fight, then, then one of the things you ask is, who gains by this information? And if it's not your side, then you, you tend to uh, suppress it or turn it or something like that. And you see that in politics all the time. Okay. Um, if you're trying to either find the truth or establish your position as, a, as an objective scholar who later centuries will agree with, um, then you tend to be much more careful and much more honest because you realize that yeah, you can probably win for 
uh, you know, five years or something like that, maybe 10 years, maybe 40, but way down the line, people will say, oh, he was a creature of his time and he just didn't know. He was really kind of stupid or really kind of ignorant or whatever. Uh, um, now, I, I will say that there are two things that can twist. It is not just in the middle of a political fight that you want your side to win, but there's also the question of uh, who's doing the funding. And if you run afoul of the funders, even if you are right, uh, the people 50 years from now may be, may be willing to fund your research, but the people right now don't. And so that can create a crimp in your style. Uh, so there, there is that factor. The other factor is that we're developing new technologies that they didn't have back then. I mean, when Darwin wrote his theory, they didn't know about DNA. DNA period, let alone DNA sequencing in ancient fossils. And so some of this stuff is just coming out and becoming more obvious now because we now know we can, we can do that kind of stuff. Um, and one of the things that's, uh, I mean, you read these things about the, for example, the Canaanites are 5,000, or what is it, 3,500 years old or 4,000, whatever it is. Uh, 4,000 years, boy. Does DNA last that long? Probably not. Well, apparently if you get the right places, the right people, it can. Uh, at least enough pieces of it to actually get some sequence out of. Well, you know, this kind of thing happened with dinosaurs, you know. <coughs> there was a time when people thought all the dinosaurs, it couldn't last that long, so all of the f tissue is gone and it's been replaced by, by minerals. I mean, I remember being taught that when I was a kid. Well, it's not really dinosaur bone. It's really the minerals that have replaced it. And so they're kind of what's left over. And to a certain extent, some of that's true. But it turns out that there is actual uh, tissue there. And then that raises the question, well, how long does tissue last? And the old answer is, well, it couldn't last that long. And Mary Schweitzer, when she started on this, said quite frankly that she didn't know it couldn't be found. <laughs> Think about yeah. that. She didn't know it could not be found? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> See? And, and so there's a whole bunch of stuff that we have been taught that it can't possibly be there. So, don't look for it. Uh, so we don't look for it. Well, so uh, that, for that matter, carbon-14 in coal is something that shouldn't be there. May I ask you this before, but is that, so has that upended some certain ideas then, or has that just fallen in a black hole, this whole idea of that there really was red blood cells and tissue and so forth? Has there well, been uh, it, ongoing it's, discussion that we're just not tuned into, or what? The scientific community knows about it, but it's not going to get into the popular press very much. Uh, when it does, it's going to be, well, but the creationists will use this. Yeah, but why not? I mean, because then you're going to sell more newspapers if you're printing something that's sensational. So there's always this tension well, to, okay, uh, but, even if you're a conspiracy. See, if you're the New York Times and you know your audience, you won't sell more newspapers. You'll sell fewer. <laughs> All right, but there's some newspapers somewhere that's going to. Conservative newspapers would, so the Wall Street Journal will sell more. Uh, well, well, it depends. If they're religious conservative, yes. If they're atheist conservative, and there, there is a section like that, uh, then no, they won't sell more. Um, I, I agree with you, but, but see, the other thing is that there is the Darwin bots who try to squelch any of this that they can. Or if, if they can't squelch it, they at least try to mislead. We knew that all along. And, all of this stuff is irrelevant and uh, 
besides that, you know, and I mean, all kinds of reasons, some of which are contradictory to each other, sure. but all of which serve the purpose of diffusing the conflict so that people won't see that there's a real scientific problem here. Did, did Neanderthals uh, live in their own location? Uh, so, um, and, and only interbred with um, Homo sapiens, uh, for lack of a better term, at the, at the junction. Um, because, uh, say for example, pygmies are a, they're, they're clearly Homo sapiens, but they are a distinct population. It's not like every 20th of us happens to be a pygmy. No, the, the way the pygmies maintain themselves is they are sort of tribally isolated and they breed within themselves and therefore they maintain their characteristics. So I'm imagining that Neanderthals were the same sort of thing, but if the Neanderthals were sort of spread out and they're, you know, it's, it's Well, that's the thing. They come oh, the, the Neander Valley in, around Dusseldorf in Germany. There's some in France, Aisha Le Sapel. There's apparently some over in Spain in the uh, Cima de los Huesos. There's uh, some in, uh, uh, probably some in Siberia, because one of the Neanderthals that was sequenced was a female in, uh, in Siberia. So that's quite a spread. Now I'm not saying that within those, uh, you know, obviously there wasn't a mail order bride service that you could uh, send send people from uh, Spain over to Siberia, you know. www.dateneanderthal.com, that doesn't, <laughs> didn't exist. Well, were they that different to begin with? But, they would have but, there, but there are, um, you can see in linguistic maps of different places, you can see like, uh, I don't know, let's say Dravidians, I think, where you can see where the, you have these little pockets of Dravidian speakers. And you can sort of tell that they used to live in this region, but they were sort of invaded by a, a dominant sort of language. But you still have these pockets, and the only way you can maintain those languages within the pockets is if they associate with themselves. And obviously, language, you tend to associate people who speak your own language, yeah. obviously. Well, it's a lot easier if you can talk their language. If you, if you, right. And so, and so people from Finland speak Finnish, which is a totally different language from most of Europe. I think there's... Uh, Hungarian and Estonian. Hungarian is right. the same way. Wow. Uh, and, and interestingly enough, because my, my son knows Hungarian and Chinese well, and he says you can see a lot of similarities between them. Uh, yeah, so, so Hungarian probably came from Central Europe, which is not surprising. Attila the Hun was a and the Magyars were from Central Europe, so, you know, they probably carried some variant of uh, Chinese, so you know, could, could and you can be, still... Could there maybe have been an ethnic or linguistic reason to why they sort of maintain their characteristics without just immediately bleeding in to the oh, rest sure. of the population? Oh, sure. But, but what could happen is that if they got small enough, then the, the larger, uh, pretty soon people speak both languages and then pretty soon the kids right. don't speak the parents' language, you know, the grandkids. You, know, you, you can see that happen with, let's say, Spanish people who come to the United States. And, the, and grandma can't speak a lick of, Span of English and mom is, does kind of okay and the kids do, um, the kids speak more English and Spanish and if they don't make a concerted effort, their kids won't have any Spanish at all. I, you know, uh, my grandpa was from uh, Friesland. And I used up half my Fries. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, but, you know, it didn't translate straight on. My, on my other side, great-great-great-grandfather, I think it is, came from uh, Germany, you know, Gim is a German name. Uh, my grandfather couldn't speak German, you know. Yeah. By the time he got there, he spoke a little bit of Spanish, and that was it. And uh, it was from visiting Mexico, uh, how he picked it up, not, not from having relatives. 
Um, and so that kind of thing happens all the time. You get people who, you know, whose, whose, whose name is uh, Wiemeister, and they speak Spanish and no German at all. Because they're, South America. yeah, they moved to South America and the kids just picked up the, the uh, and it's, you know, that happens all the time if you think about it. Uh, and so you can see how f at first there might be a community, but then as time goes on, they visit other people, they uh, become acculturated, they intermarry, and pretty soon they disappear. But that's what I was trying to say with my own ancestral studies. In other words, I was absolutely flabbergasted to find out that Irish stock going back to before Christ was born. And the point that, that it seems to illustrate is that we think, you know, you can't go across national borders and cultural language borders. Yet the town I'm born, well, this village actually, that I, my ancestors are born in Finland, it was one of the Hansa League ports. M built beautiful boats. They don't the do Celtics that uh, came through? No, no, they weren't Celts. I mean, we're, we're Finns, but we have ancestors we can trace to, to, yeah. to the Irish royal family somewhere. Funny, you know, it's nice to have our uh, uh, royal family. But the point is we had in the 1400s when the Hansa League was really dominant. I mean, there was a European Union there, and the Germans were traveling all over the place in the Baltic, and Finnish towns even were built to accommodate the German trade. You still have Bergen in Norway, which has the last remaining Hansa League trading post. So there was a much, much more movement, and although, for instance, the Thirty Year War destroyed 50% of the German population over a 30 year period, so it was a bloody war, but it was easier to travel. And of course, in uh, Gustav Vasa's uh, military, for instance, he had Dutch and he had Scottish troops, like eight and 12,000, and about 35,000 Finns and 20,000 Swedes. So they were leaving their seed everywhere. Now, I don't know how that compares with, say, 2,000 years ago, but I suspect if you think, for instance, of uh, the Ionan missionaries that were going all over Europe, how did they manage to do that when it was a bloody dangerous place? It wasn't. We have become worse. We just don't like to admit that the last 100 years was worse than it was in any 100 years before that in European history. When we had the Romans controlling southern Europe, we had the peace of Rome. So if you had Nedentals or the Sama people, who are probably among, most isolated in Europe, but they can find evidence of them having lived far south. In fact, in the oracles of the, um, of the Greek people, they talk about the queen of the north, that's my term for it, sending a gift to Olympia every season they had the Olympic festivals. And as far as we can work out, that woman was a Finn. And we said, well, what? Um, so what language did they speak? Well, you always had some people, kids pick up, pick up languages. You go to Zambia, and an average Zambian kid living in a mud floored village speaks four languages and learns English and possibly French when they go to school. We are the ignorant lot. We speak one or two languages and that's it. I've studied five and I can only communicate in two. But those kids, four totally different languages from each other, plus English and French. Now that's a smart people. We would label them, of course, 200 years ago as being primitive. We just get it wrong. Yeah, we do, we do. You know, I'm, I'm trilingual, that is, I try to be lingual. Anyway, come back next week. We'll uh, talk about Homo erectus.